Integral Medicine Chief Residence this academic year. Welcome to Grand Rounds this Thursday morning. Today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Craig Buckman. Dr. Craig Buckman is a Lindbergh Professor and Chair in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery here at WashU in St. Louis. He completed his internship, research fellowship, and residency at the University of Pittsburgh, and his clinical fellowship in neurotology and skull-based surgery at the House Ear Clinic in Los Angeles. He is the current chair of the William House Cochlear Implant Study Group, the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing, and the president-elect of the American Neurotology Society. He was also a founding board member of the American Cochlear Implant Alliance and its past chairman of the board. Dr. Buckman has published extensively in peer-reviewed literature, and his research is funded by the NIH and the Department of Defense for studies in cochlear implant performance and noise-induced hearing loss. Today, he joins us to discuss the role of cochlear implants in adults. Thank you so much, Dr. Buckman, for being here with us this morning. Great. Thanks for that uh, <clears throat> introduction, and thanks for having me today. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think this is a topic that uh, probably many of you don't know much about, and so <clears throat> what I thought I would do today is sort of take it from the ground level and, and uh, talk about it. Um, some of this uh, came out of a conversation I was actually ha having with uh, Vicki Fraser at one of our meetings, um, and uh, she uh, mentioned the fact that uh, she was um, surprised that cochlear implants were even used in adults, thought they were more for children. So I think this is a good opportunity just to create awareness. So um, my objectives <clears throat> today are um, for you all to better understand um, hearing loss and recognize that it's not always obvious. Um, and masking in the time of COVID has actually revealed um, you know, a lot of people with uh, difficulty in, in communicating. Hearing loss negatively impacts communication, cognition, psychosocial well-being, and quality of life. Um, people with hearing loss should be evaluated by health professionals, audiologists, and otolaryngologists. And then you know, finally, cochlear implants aren't just for kids. Um, they're no longer experimental. They've been around for, for uh, well over 30 years now. They work really well, and uh, they're very underutilized. So that, those are my points that I'd, I'd like to try and make today as we go. So I'm going to present just a, a, a case that will sort of follow through um, as we go, just so that I can, you, we can sort of keep it real. Um, so this is a, a gentleman I saw back in 2017 initially. He was 60. 60 um, four at the time, or 63 at the time. He was first diagnosed with hearing loss when he entered the Navy at 22 years of age. Um, in 1995, um, he went to get tested because he was having problems hearing his watch uh, beep. Um, and he described his problem as difficulty in both quiet as well as in background noise, misses a lot of words and meaning, can still hear things, but can't really understand. Um, he was a priest, um, or still is a priest, and uh, he requested transfer out of his his church because he really couldn't um, uh, communicate um, with his paris parishioners. Um, he had worn hearing aids uh, since 2002, um, but still noticed, and this is a really common thing you'll hear, is that people get hearing aids, it makes it louder, but they still can't um, understand what people are saying when their hearing gets bad, so it's, it uh, really impacts the clarity. Um, some will even describe it as the Charlie Brown teacher, for those of you who are old enough to to re remember the Charlie Brown teacher. And then he has tinnitus, which is high pitched constant crickets, um, which have been there for 30 years and they're, they're there all the time with no dizziness. So just by way of uh, sort of understanding the impact of hearing loss, um, the World Health Organization looked back at this in 2018. And uh, you know, currently it's thought that there's roughly about 460 million people worldwide um, with hearing loss. And only a small portion of those are children. And the estimates are that this will continue to grow um, to 2030, you see 630 million and as much as 900 million people impacted by hearing loss as, uh, as we get to 2050. This has to do, of course, with advancing age as well as the impact of noise. Um, noise remains a real problem. Um, many people are walking around with earbuds in their ears these days. The, there's an underlying genetic predisposition as well. Um, so, so most are guessing this is gonna rise to, to really huge levels. When you look at it in the United States, it's roughly about 40 million people with hearing loss and 17% of adults that are 20 to, to 70 have um, noise induced hearing loss. Um, that and tinnitus, hearing loss and tinnitus are the two most common um, disabilities that people leave the military with. Um, so it's a major issue, of course, for the military and those that are over 75 years of age, uh, nearly half of them have substantial hearing loss. More, uh, less common conditions like Meniere's disease, which is 
intermittent vertigo um, together with unilateral hearing loss impacts about 600,000. Sudden deafness we see um, very frequently actually in our practices, but there's about 4,000 new cases of that a year. And then acoustic neuroma, which is a tumor, pretty rare, about one per 100,000 every year. The, the key thing to remember about hearing loss is first of all, you can't see it, which is, which is um, you know, most people can sort of masquerade as, as getting along okay. Um, a lot of head nodding, but really hearing loss um, negatively impacts communication. Wearing a mask, of course, doubles that down in a big way. Um, and it results really in social isolation, a lot of anxiety. Uh, people become depressed. Um, there's been a fair amount of literature now that has, has uh, linked uh, hearing loss to cognitive decline um, and dementia. And there's um, emerging literature now on the fact that that uh, hearing loss, restoration of hearing loss uh, can um, positively impact that as well. It's also been linked to falls, um, probably because of reduction in inner ear function, among other things. So the, uh, the Lancet Commission published in 2017, um, this uh, work looking at dementia uh, uh, prevention and intervention. And what was recognized in that document was that um, hearing loss is probably the, the single largest modifiable um, risk factor um, for uh, dementia. And so there's really been a push to try and uh, think about identifying hearing loss and of course, treating it, especially in um, the uh, uh, population of adults that has cognitive decline. And we're seeing patients uh, very frequently now uh, that fall in this uh, category. So just to back up and talk a little bit about the ear um, and uh, just give you a review of the anatomy. So, so uh, as a surgeon, it's always uh, important for us to think anatomically about these things. And so uh, here, here's a, a cartoon of the, of the ear and you recognize the oracle or, or pin on the, of the external ear and the external auditory canal. Uh, the tympanic membrane, of course, is at the distal end of the canal. And then that attaches to the malleus, incus, and stapes of the middle ear. Um, and then the transduction of sound comes across the, uh, across the acicular chain and into the inner ear, which is the cochlea. And we'll show you a little more detail about the cochlea. But remember the semicircular canals and, and otoliths are also um, in the inner ear and they're important for um, um, head stabilization and gaze stabilization. And then of course the cochlea turns the, the vibrations of sound into nerve impulses that go to the brain. So this is, uh, again, this cartoon I think is good just to conceptualize uh, how the ear works. Sound comes in and hits the tympanic membrane and then drives the fluids of the inner ear with vibration. And then what that does is along the, so the basilar membrane, which is this uh, uh, membrane that has the organ of cordy or the hair cells in it, it creates a standing wave. So the sound pressure creates these deflections, um, uh, which then activate the, the uh, inner ear. Um, so this is sort of a cross section of the cochlea. Uh, if you cut across it, there's three chambers, a scale of tympani, a scale of vestibuli, and a scale of media. And so when those sounds come into the cochlea and, and uh, um, move the fluid, the basilar membrane here moves up and down. And you can see here's the organ of cordy, which is where the hair cells live. And so this is sort of a higher magnification. So down here would be that scale of tympani, the basilar membrane would be moving. And then you see there's three outer hair cells and an inner hair cell, which are embedded in this tectorial membrane. So as this vibrates up and down, it then activates um, these hair cells via uh, stereo uh, cilia deflection. And that's what results in depolarization. So most hearing losses uh, that we see are of the sensory neural type, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, and so that means that there's generally a, a problem in the organ of cordy. Um, but the nerve fibers are usually, uh, usually present, and that's important with regards to a cochlear implant. And so this is another key um, concept, and that's that the cochlea, you know, you think of it like a snail here, um, and it starts and then winds deeper. Um, the, this portion of the, of the cochlea um, codes high pitch frequencies. And so as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the cochlea, you're basically moving down the piano keyboard uh, to lower and lower frequencies. So the individual nerve fibers that then come to the cochlea are then basically tuned to individual frequencies. So you can envision if you put electrodes inside the cochlea along its length, that each of those electrodes, as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, would activate lower and lower and lower frequency sounds. And really that's the key reason why cochlear implants actually work. 
So this again is another sort of a rendition just to show that that um, you know the ossicular chain is here and then the sounds come into the cochlea. They go through the organ of Corti, which is here in the various turns, and then the nerves are activated, which go to the brain. They synapse in the pons and then go to, to higher auditory stations, which I'm not going to get into much of the details, but it, it does uh, track bilaterally and up to um, the auditory cortex. So um, just by way of review, uh, for those of you who see patients that have um, you know, hearing complaints, we like to think of hearing loss as either conductive or sensory neural. Um, conductive hearing losses are those that impact the ear canal, the external auditory canal, the tympanic membrane, or the ossicular chain. So when someone comes in and says their ear is plugged, when we look in their ear, right, if there's a plug of wax, um, especially if it's completely obstructive, that'll cause a conductive hearing loss if there's a hole in the eardrum, if there's a problem with the ossicular chain. And it's very, very easy um, uh, to identify whether hearing losses are, is conductive or sensory neural just by placing a 512 tuning fork um, on the forehead. If it lateralizes to the side where the hearing loss is, then it's most likely a conductive hearing loss. And if we, if we wanna figure out exactly how much it is, we can do the RINI test. The RINI test, if you'll recall, as you take that tuning fork and push push here behind the ear on the bone and ask if it's louder on the bone or through the air. If it's louder on the, the bone than the air, then there's probably a 25 decibel loss or more. So um, that's a, a simple test. The Weber test actually is a, a very easy one. Put it in the middle of the head. If it lateralizes to that, to the affected ear, then most likely it's a conductive loss. Conductive losses are generally treatable through um, medical surgical issues. Sensory neural uh, ones oftentimes um, uh, go on to hearing aids or cochlear implants, although there are some medically treatable sensory neural losses. So again, sensory neural loss is beyond the stapes. So that's gonna be the cochlea, um, the nerves or the brain. So, so uh, for people who have hearing loss, of course, we wanna try and first of all, identify if their communication problems are related to hearing loss. We wanna make an appropriate medical diagnosis um, and then intervene. Um, questions that you all can answer uh, can ask uh, when you're seeing a patient in the clinic. They're, sim they're simple questions to try and identify hearing loss. And I would say it's one of our biggest opportunities in, in better identifying these individuals is actually asking the direct questions. Do you have difficulty in communication? Is it is it difficult, especially um, in background noise? Oftentimes, um, uh, loved ones will relay the fact that the TV is exceedingly loud. Um, uh, those that can't talk on the phone because of their hearing loss are almost always a cochlear implant candidate. Um, and one of the practical things that I suggest to people is if, to other physicians is that um, when they're when they walk into the room, if you turn around and flip on the water to wash your hands, if you ask a question or two while the water's on, um, if the patient really struggles with that, then they might have hearing loss. And then lastly, now, of course, with masks, if you just walk in with your mask on and try and have a conversation, if people are really struggling uh, with that, then, then obviously hearing loss is something to think about. Um, and, and the simple issue is that the patient that you think may or may not have a hearing loss should get an audiogram and an assessment by a, a ENT doctor. So what's an audiogram? An audiogram is basically a, a, a test where you put someone in a, in a soundproof booth and then you present sounds to the ears individually at low um, frequencies and at higher and higher and higher frequencies. And these are the, the frequencies here across the X axis. And then as you have to turn the sounds up louder and louder and louder for someone to respond, then we can come up with a threshold. Um, normal hearing ability is roughly less than 25 decibels. And then you can see the various um, levels of mild, moderate, severe, and profound hearing loss. And I'm gonna try and um, present you some sound cards here so you can see, sort of have a sense for that. There's two parts to hearing. There's both the, the frequency part and then there's also the word clarity part. Sometimes people can have a big drop off in their clarity without a big drop off in their tones. Um, and oftentimes that goes along with a more neural type of hearing loss. Um, and so what they do is after we do this tone business, then what we do is we um, uh, play them a pre-recorded CD um, with 25 to 50 words, and then they um, uh, respond, uh, you know, say the word ball, and then the person responds ball, and then those are graded. Um, and so we come up with a word recognition score. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when people have conductive hearing losses, 
especially if they're in one ear, if they're if they have asymmetric loss fluctuating, or they have vertigo or facial weakness, they definitely require a workup. So if someone says their hearing is down in one ear, they definitely need to be evaluated. So I'm going to see if I can't um, uh, play this sound for you. Th these are these are simulations. Um, so they're not exactly uh, perfect, but I think it's a good opportunity just to have a sense for what hearing loss is like. Um, this is uh, the, there's a website there that you can see, but uh, this is sort of a simulation of what normal hearing would be like. This is just sort of to give you a, a baseline. Going? Good, good. <laughs> Obviously, just to stop for a second, this is done in, in a restaurant, simulated as a restaurant. So um, there's a background background sounds as well going on. Good tuna milk, good. Oh, so good. Oh, here I'll take this one. Thank you. Uh, refill on the ice. So per, not not the easiest of hearing situations, but that's thought to be pretty close to normal. This is what mild hearing loss would do. The thing to concentrate on is both how it brings down the the loudness of the tones, but also how it starts to change the word clarity. Yeah, oh, sure. Just one. I'll be right back. Thank you. So guess who I ran into from high school the other day? So I think everyone would agree that they can definitely hear what these people are saying, um, but there is uh, some difficulty in picking out the words. Um, for a moderate hearing loss, so this is about, you know, halfway down the chart on that audiogram. Again, they're trying to simulate sort of word clarity issues as well. Okay, and that's a moderate loss. Many people with moderate loss can still be fit with a hearing aid and do okay. And then this is a simulation of a severe hearing loss. And I'm going to turn this up as loud as my computer will allow it. Um, and so it's still going to be difficult to hear, as you guess, because it's a severe hearing loss. <laughs> So that's just to give you some sense. Um, and so as you start to get beyond moderate hearing loss, you start to really recognize that um, you know this, this really impacts your ability to communicate. And you can envision if you're wearing a mask, it's essentially impossible to, to understand you know, what's, uh, what's being said. So moving along here. So this is our patient, um, just to give you some sense in 2017. Here's his audiogram, low frequencies to high frequencies. Further down, the chart is bad. Basically, anything above 25 decibels, which is less than 25 decibels, would be normal. The right ear is the red. The left ear is the X. And so what you would say, he has basically normal at 250, and then mild sloping down to severe hearing loss um, in 2017. He was complaining an awful lot at that time about difficulty um, again, you know, in, in quiet as well as in background noise. When we turned it up loud enough, his word recognition scores were 44% and 68%. That means that he could get roughly half of the words correct when it was turned up loud enough. So in wearing hearing aids and turning it up loud, you can still see that he's missing half of the, the words and sentences and in a conversation. So he underwent a cochlear implant evaluation, and we'll talk about what that means here in a second, but the cochlear implant evaluation is sort of the next step for someone who's struggling with hearing aids. And what we do is we actually make sure they're best fit with their hearing aids, and then we do further speech perception testing. And so there's they, we present them with both sentences and words. The sentences are presented in background noise, uh, probably a slightly less noise than what you heard on that simulation in the restaurant. So plus 10, plus 10 means that roughly the signal that you care about is about 10 decibels louder than the background noise. And what you could see for this gentleman is that wearing his hearing aids in both ears, he could get about 60% of the words correct. Um, in his right ear, his right ear was very bad um, with only 22% of the words correct. And then the left was 52. And then doing the, these single words, again, say the word ball, say, say the word horse, um, he could get roughly about one in five words correct as well. And again, lots of problems in quiet, lots of problems in noise, difficulty in communication. So by, by you know, by all accounts, um, he's a cochlear implant candidate because it's extremely poor word recognition um, in his right ear. So what is a cochlear implant? Um, just, to, just so everyone um, is sort of centered on this, a cochlear implant is an implanted device um, it's placed under the skin here behind the ear, um, and this is a, um, a receiver stimulator. And so 
And then there's an electrode array that goes down through the mastoid and then into the inner ear or cochlea. And there's multiple electrodes that are placed here along the cochlear length as, as we talked about. And so these first electrodes would stimulate high frequencies and then deeper and deeper and deeper are gonna be low frequencies. There's an external processor that the patient wears um, that has a microphone. And so what the device does is it picks up the sound, it encodes it into the different frequency and intensities. So low tones, high tones, and how loud those are. And then what it does is it, it creates a digital signal. Um, that digital signal is then is sent across the skin by radio waves. There's no physical connection. Um, so nothing is actually sticking through the skin. There's just two magnets that align these radio transducers. And so the high frequencies are sent across this internal device then stimulates in this area for the high frequencies and then for the deeper areas in the low frequency. So you get some sense of what this looks like up close, electrodes close to those um, cochlear nerve fibers. And so this just, uh, again, is another cartoon that shows what, the, uh, what this looks like in the cochlea in terms of um, uh, you know, the relationship to the various nerve fibers. So things that we think about when we think about cochlear implantation is, um, uh, of course, obviously their, their hearing function or their audiometric function. And this is tested with an audiogram as well as testing with hearing aids like I showed you. Um, we also do a, um, uh, a, a, a very, very basic uh, cognitive uh, screen um, using the MOCA. Um, and this just gives us some sense of, of how much cognitive uh, uh, capacity an individual might have. We look at temporal bone anatomy, of course, because we have to place this um, inside the, the inner ear. Um, uh, patients generally choose uh, what device they want. There's three different manufacturers. And um, in most cases, the device that they choose um, is not really a sort of a medical decision. And so uh, for the most part, surgeons uh, stay out of the device considerations. They're, they're um, uh, basically the patients decide which one they want. And then, and then you know, we implant that. We like to know about their associated medical conditions because those can have an impact, as you would guess, uh, specifically, you know, neurologic conditions and, and whatnot. Um, and then we take a lot of time to talk to the family and patient uh, uh, specifically about the time course of how they'll um, improve over time. So it's not a thing where you just uh, go to the go to the operating room, get a surgery and then leave, um, you know, hearing better uh, because we're changing their hearing. It takes some time and there's a, a fair amount of training that goes on postoperatively. So this is just a CAT scan of the temporal bones just to show you that the cartoons that I showed you earlier are actually really translatable. Here's the ear canal, tympanic membrane, the malleus is here, the incus is here, this is the cochlea, and then you can see the cochlea and then the internal auditory canal where the nerves go to the brain. And this shows an MRI that the imaging really is beautiful these days. Um, and what, what you can see is you can see the, the cochlea here on the left side. You can see a beauty, beautiful example of the, the cochlear or the eighth nerve and the vestibular nerves also going to the inner ear as well. So all of this is very um, discernible on imaging these days. And you can even see the, the basilar membrane here inside the cochlea. So surgery uh, with a cochlear implant generally takes about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, patients can come and go the same day. Um, usually they're not, um, uh, there's not a lot of pain because it's not a very mobile area. Um, and there's not usually a whole lot of negative downsides that come from the surgery. Sometimes elderly patients will be dizzy for a few days, although vertigo um, is uh, still pretty uh, uncom um, un uncommon. And again, we put in all three of the various devices. I'd like to try and show you a video here if possible. We'll see how this, uh, how this works. I'm just going to move through this sort of quickly, just so you have some sense. So, so just to orient everybody, the top of the head is up this direction. The bottom of the head is this direction. So the mastoid tip behind the ear would be right here. There's been an incision made. This is the external auditory canal from behind. And you can see the pinna here behind this retractor. So this is the bone of the mastoid. The temporal lobe comes down right to about this area. Um, and then you'll see we open the, the, um, the mastoid uh, with, a, with a drill. Um, takes just a few minutes to do this. And you'll see it uh, sort of looks a little bit like honeycomb cereal. It has um, air spaces 
um, in there. And uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward to do. Most patients with a cochlear implant don't have a bunch of disease in their mastoid. So you can see with the drill, it's actually very easy to open. And, and uh, um, you know, we do this literally hundreds of times a year. Um, so um, this, so now we've opened the mastoid. This is just under the temporal lobe. This is the ear canal here. Um, here's the, the incus bone uh, that you can see uh, just, and, and so the opening that we make as we go forward is just medial to the eardrum. And I'll try and show you just medial to the tympanic membrane here. I'll just move us along here. Just so you don't, I don't have to torture everybody with watching a bunch of surgery. So now we've opened the, the middle ear. Um, and so here's that incus. Um, the facial nerve sits here. This is the corda tympani nerve, which supplies taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Um, and then this is the stapes here. And then what you'll see is down in this area is the round window, which is that basal part of the cochlea. Um, and that's where we ultimately make our opening. So I'm just gonna move us along here just so we don't have to spend too much time watching this. Sorry. So, so we identify, again, here's the, the stapes bone. Um, and then this, so now we're in the middle ear, the eardrum is out at this level. So we're under the eardrum. And then this is the round window membrane, which makes the opening into the the basal part of the cochlea where the high frequencies are. Um, this drill that you're looking at, that's one millimeter in size, just to give you some sense for size. This opening here is about two millimeters. So pretty small stuff, um, but we use this one millimeter um, burr um, to uh, open up the cochlea. Again, I'll move us along just so you have some sense for So you can see an opening here into the cochlea, and then I'm just gonna move us along again. So this is the device part, and I think this is important for you to see. So the device has been implanted under the skin here in the back. Um, and then this is the electrode array from the cochlear implant. And then along this array, there's lots of different electrodes, as you would um, guess there's, in this particular device, there's 22. Um, and then there's a stylet here. And so what you'll see is we'll take this device and then we'll place it in the cochlea and then we'll push it off just like a cell dinger technique. And what that does is that that allows this electrode to curve around the cochlea as it goes in. So you can see how this is implanted. So there's the opening that we made. The electrode is placed in. And then we grab onto this little wire here on the back. And then just give a push. Um, takes just a second or two to, to push it in. So that's that. We'll go back to our other uh, slides. So um, generally pretty straightforward surgery to do. Um, doesn't take uh, too long. And again, uh, pretty rarely complicated. And most people go home the, the same day wearing a bandage for a couple of days. Um, usually the first night they can take, uh, you know, they can take some narcotics. So usually it's like one dose of narcotics and then usually ibuprofen um, and, uh, and Tylenol. So this is what it looks like afterwards. So um, what you can see here is uh, this is the patient's right ear and here's that sound processor um, that's behind the ear. And then here's the, the wire going to the headpiece. Um, and, and if you take that headpiece off, it just looks like normal skin um, under this headpiece. And a, a CAT scan afterwards shows the electrodes going down through that mastoid that we opened. And then you can see the electrodes um, inside the cochlea. So that's basically the, the, the long and short of cochlear implant surgery. It used to, used to be a much bigger deal back in the day, but now it's literally a very standardized sort of thing. Doesn't leave a big bump behind the ear. Most people don't have a lot of problems with the surgical part of it. So I just wanna give you a sense for what, um, what cochlear implants accomplish in terms of um, uh, performance. Uh, I think that um, this is just uh, one clinical trial. There's been a number of clinical trials out there. It's just one that we recently did here at WashU uh, with our colleagues. And so I thought I would show you that. Um, and, and what this clinical trial does is it compares people that walk in the door that have been optimized with their hearing aids ahead of time. Um, they're, so they're fit with hearing, you know, high quality hearing aids for a month. And then we do their tests. And if their tests uh, show still poor enough performance, 
um, than they're a cochlear implant candidate. They undergo a cochlear implant um, in one of their two ears. And then I'll show you performance with what the cochlear implant by itself does. And then what a cochlear implant does adding their contralateral hearing aid back. Um, this particular trial um, was 96 patients um, in, uh, implanted over a two year period. So the, the, the um, sort of the demographics of the group is uh, these were all adults. Um, they were all um, older than age 23. You see the mean age was close to 70 years, um, uh, two thirds male and one third female. This is actually very common um, in our uh, cochlear implant trials is there's usually more men than women for whatever reason. Um, and most had a fairly long duration of hearing loss, certainly over 20 years. Ipsilateral is the ear that was implanted and of course contralateral is the hearing aid ear. But you see most of these people had um, pretty symmetric hearing. Those word scores, which is again, the ability to repeat single words while they're wearing their hearing aids preoperatively, their word scores were um, pretty bad. You see 15% in their operated ear and 24% in their contra ear. And then these were sentence scores, um, similar um, bad. And, and uh, I'll show you what their audiograms looked like just so you have a sense. So this was the entire group of patients, um, audiograms and the implant ear on the left and the non-implant ear on the right. And you see what the mean is there with the black line. But um, there's quite a range of hearing um, uh, thresholds from you know, sort of normal or near normal, like the, like the patient that we um, uh, implanted all the way down to very profound hearing loss where there's no, um, no hearing really available. And so in terms of speech perception, this gives you a sense of how these patients did on those word scores. So here uh, uh, you see the, the CNC word scores um, preoperative. So the preoperative condition is wearing um, their hearing aid alone. This particular slide that I'm showing you is only in the implant ear. So I'm not showing you using their contralateral hearing aid, but you can see on average following a cochlear implant at six months of use, um, they roughly get a 62% um, CNC word score, which is really a dramatic change um, for them. Um, and that's, of course, significant. 93% of people um, do better than they did um, on their uh, preoperative scores, and 7% 7, 7 do the same. Um, uh, and so that uh, gives you some sense of the, the, the efficacy of this um, intervention. And then if you look at the contralateral ear, this is in background noise. Again, you see a, a little bit more of a blunted response um, in terms of how well they do. Um, the reason for that is, is because noise um, has to sort of be filtered out um, and that's a, that's a brain thing. So uh, you can see still the cochlear implant improves hearing and noise substantially. Um, and then so lastly, oh, this slide's not working right. One second here, let me see if I can fix this. Yeah, this, this will give you a sense. So then lastly, this, this uh, shows our patient. Um, so he came in with, uh, you know, word scores in his, in his ear to be implanted around 20. And you can see that he did, uh, you know, close to 90% um, with his device. And in the, um, uh, and then in background noise, just in the implant ear alone, you can see the improvement up to over 60%. So big, big change. And then this looks at using the hearing aid in one ear, uh, or excuse me, the cochlear implant one ear and the hearing aid in the in the other. And again, what you can see here is uh, big improvements. You know, 87% of the of the people do better, and 13% do the same on that particular test. It's, you know, the, the a little discordant. So sometimes you see improvements in one and not improvements in the other and vice versa. Um, but again, our patient using a cochlear implant in one ear, hearing aid in the other, um, big improvements. And so th these are uh, um, uh, quality of life uh, metrics. This is the Huey, which is the health utilities index um, that many of you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, if you look at um, this, uh, this uh, group as a whole for 94 people, there's a, a big improvement in quality of life according to the Huey 3 um, at six months. And the major drivers in this were improvements in their emotional um, state, uh, improvements in, in speech, as well as, of course, a giant improvement in, in hearing that were you know, all really significant. So big improvements in quality of life metrics. Um, and then also in terms of the patient uh, reported hearing disability, um, this particular metric looks at, at um, their, their, um, how they feel about their speech and hearing, their spatial abilities or their ability to localize sound, and then also, also of course, sound quality. And so these were, these were all significantly improved. And then, you know, so, so finally, just to wrap it up, um, there, uh, with regards to, to this 
portion of the uh, of the talk. About 70% of patients can talk on the phone after a cochlear implant. Um, most cannot talk on the phone before a cochlear implant, although um, you know cell phones I think have improved that some. Um, many can return to employment. Key is that there is no need for sign language. Uh, most patients can, after they've lost their hearing and get a cochlear implant, they can they can return to a sort of normal communication or or near normal communication. Um, these results in big improvements in psychosocial well-being. And I didn't really talk much about um, anxiety and depression and isolation and those things, but there's plenty of studies that have shown um, nice improvements in those. Uh, we showed the quality of life, and then sort of the last thing is is the issue about age and cognition. Um, uh, age is, is thought to not be a contraindication to cochlear implantation. I showed you some patients up into their high 80s in that clinical trial. Um, and so we have a, a pretty low threshold to do that. Um, and in fact, cognitive decline doesn't seem to be a, um, uh, a contraindication as well. Uh, when we looked at people who walked in with poor MOCA scores versus better MOCA scores, um, both of those groups actually had improvements in their hearing. Um, the question of whether it improves cognitive decline um, is one that's uh, data is starting to accrue on. Um, it's obviously not going to get rid of cognitive decline, but if it can change the slope of cognitive decline, I think that's the that's what we're um, hoping for. And I think the early data suggests that it certainly can flatten that out, which is consistent with what the Lancet Commission was hoping for. Um, so just briefly on bilateral implants, because um, a lot of people ask, well, if one is good, is two better? And I think the long and short of it is, is that um, uh, there are advantages to two implants. Most adults don't go for two. Um, the good thing about two implants is that you always implant the better ear because there is certainly some differences from ear to ear. Um, two ears are better than one in the fact that they summate together. So they help you improve hearing in both quiet and noise. And then the key issues are really sound localization, uh, which is really made a lot better. The, the downside of course, is that it's two surgeries. Um, oftentimes people lose their residual hearing. Um, when they get a cochlear implant. So that, that takes a, a little bit for patients to tolerate whether they're willing to, to do that. Um, and and uh, there might be future biologic therapies that are coming. And so some wanna hold on to that ear uh, for that potential um, that potential benefit if it happens in the, in the future. Um, of course, in the elderly, we do worry about vestibular side effects, but we haven't seen that as a major issue. But if you did it in both ears, you could you can imagine um, that that uh, might be a problem. And then um, the economics, actually, because these devices are expensive, they, they uh, can be, um, you know, over $20,000. Insurance totally pays for this, um, but it's, still, it's certainly a, an economic issue in the sense that the first year is like turning the light on, but the second year is like adjusting the dimmer. So you have to sort of ask yourself whether the expense is, is um, you know, is worth it for the, for the individual. On the other hand, you know, if you don't get a cochlear implant and you wear a hearing aid, um, hearing aid uh, costs on an annual basis are actually quite high as well. So just to give you a sense of our patient, he actually elected to go on to get a second, um, his second ear implanted. He became frustrated with his, uh, um, with his hearing aid ear. And so he wanted to improve upon that. And so this was the, the scores of his second ear um, in the CI alone. So he started, you know, slightly better in that second ear. And you saw a big improvement in the second ear uh, in both quiet and in noise. And then um, what's uh, interesting is that when we uh, compared both ears using a hearing aid basically to both ears using cochlear implants, um, again, the cochlear implant brought him up to here and then the second implant brought him up to here. So now he's you know, in the um, mid to high 90s in terms of um, uh, word recognition. He's completely back to um, uh, preaching in his, his uh, church. Um, and you know, he's able to, to really do an awful lot better in both quiet and noise and feels his sense is that he has better balance. That's uh, one of the things that he's uh, relayed to me over time. So uh, just to finish up here and then we'll have uh, an opportunity uh, for questions. Um, the, the sad part about cochlear implants in some ways is that the FDA um, approved use in adults in 1986, but even as of today, many people don't recognize um, that they're, they're sort of um, out there and approved. Um, we certainly have an awareness issue. For children, they were approved in 1990, so they're 31 years um, they've been approved. And so of that over 400 million people that are out there, there's probably, there's probably about 50 million people that are um, uh, truly cochlear implant candidates for sure, um, and yet only somewhere between 5 and 7, 8% maybe of the, the candidate population um, is getting them. 
Now in children, it's much higher. We have a much better control over the pediatric population in the sense that um, newborn infant screening is mandated in all 50 states now or is highly you know, recommended in all, all the states and there's programs. And so for children, we identify the kids early on, they get enrolled um, into early intervention programs and we can move them through the process pretty quickly. But adults really in a lot of ways are, are out there um, in a place that we can't always identify them. You might be seeing them in your offices and uh, they might be going to to um, you know hearing aid dealers or or other areas, and so so um, identifying the adults is actually hard, and so that's one of the things to remember to think about today is that if someone's having difficulty in communication, especially with masks on, you should think about suggesting that they get you know a um, an audiogram. Um, some of the reasons for for low penetration is really um, probably the single most important one is is general lack of awareness. People just don't understand that these devices are out there and that they work. Um, the referral networks are, um, are complex and um, there's still some political issues that are out there. And I, I bring this up just to say um, that uh, there's uh, uh, always been sort of a fascination with deaf culture in the United States, more so than what you see um, in Europe. And people are very concerned about upsetting the deaf culture, um, which we all understand um, most, um, most families uh, of, or most parents of two hearing kids or, or most hearing parents of a child with, with hearing loss want their child to hear. And so most don't actually go um, for deaf culture or deaf into the deaf community these days. And adults that have heard their whole life, um, they generally wanna keep hearing. And so um, it's not really a hard um, sell for most people who are hearing and talking that if their hearing goes away, that they want to get a cochlear implant. So a lot of it just, I think, is about getting people um, into the pipeline. So it's sort of to summarize, um, you don't have to be deaf to be a cochlear implant candidate. Um, if your patient struggles in quiet or in background noise, um, they need to get a hearing test. Um, and it doesn't, you can't be too old. Um, you know, we put these, these into patients that are, that are struggling because communication many times at the end of life is one of the single most important facets that are out there. So we've implanted patients with metastatic um, cancer and and uh, and all kinds of other things because they uh, very much want to communicate with their loved ones. Surgery is safe; it's outpatient, um, and uh, devices last an awful long time. Uh, the one thing to think about is that, uh, and and this was something I wanted to bring up, is that uh, that when you get a cochlear implant and you have it turned on on the first few days, it can sound very weird and mechanical, but that sort of goes away over time. Um, there was a recent movie. Um, the Sound of Metal, and I don't know how many of you all have uh, seen this movie, but it's out there. Um, and it sort of misportrays uh, what cochlear implants are like. Um, I do encourage you to watch it because it's interesting, but the, the, the things that they said in the movie that were completely off base is that they aren't covered by insurance. Um, cochlear implants are covered by insurance. And then they showed, they, they, they really sort of embellished the poor sound quality. Um, and uh, generally speaking, you know, at initial activation, the sound quality is um, unusual. And then what happens is over time, it clarifies. So by three months, um, you're probably, uh, you know, achieving 80 or 90% of your performance. And by a year, you're certainly, um, you know, have achieved uh, most of your performance. So um, I think that that's all the, that's all the comments I had today. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, give you all an opportunity to ask some questions and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Buckman. I found that to be very informative. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in. Some are a little bit um, quick, quick ones here. So one question is, does Missouri Medicaid pay for cochlear implants? Uh, so that's a really good question. So uh, Missouri Medicaid pays for cochlear implants in children. Um, they don't pay um, enough to even cover the cost of the device. Um, so it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, a great payment, but they do pay. And Illinois Medicaid also pays in children. Um, uh, but neither of them cover uh, cochlear implants in adults. Um, now, most, uh, most adult patients, if they have substantial hearing loss, they actually are, are eligible to be disabled. Um, if they have cochlear implant level hearing, you know, hearing that, that requires cochlear implant, they can be disabled. So they actually can be enrolled in Medicare um, earlier on in life. So what we do is encourage people that if, if they're a cochlear implant candidate and they don't have um, insurance or they're on Medicaid is to convert over to Medicare and then they can be funded. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. Sure. Um, another question is about the electrodes. So there's 22 electrodes in the device. Are patients therefore restricted to only identifying 22 different frequencies of sound? 
No, that's a great question too. So, so um, the the three the three devices have either um, 12, 16, or 22 electrodes. Those are the three different companies. And uh, what you can envision is that while there are individual electrodes that produce an individual frequency percept, you can actually also create virtual channels between the two electrodes. So if you activate two electrodes um, that are adjacent to each other at different levels, then you can create a um, uh, electrical field maxima that's somewhere between the two. And so in theory, you can have an unlimited number of, of uh, frequency channels that are out there. Okay, great. Um, one question is, how do we refer patients for this evaluation? Would that be um, referring them to ENT? Do we need to specify anything further? Or you guys kind of take it from there. Yeah, if you just refer to ENT here, um, we're happy to see them and we can take care of all the details. And then someone asks as well, are there patients who are not good candidates for this? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, they're, they're unusual patients. So if you have too much hearing and you do well with your hearing aids, then you don't want a cochlear implant. So that's the obvious thing. Um, if, uh, if someone has had um, head trauma and they've uh, um, fractured their skull to the point that they've transected their auditory nerves, um, then you can envision that putting a cochlear implant in your cochlea if there's no connection to the brain would be bad. Um, and then there's patients that are sort of relatively uh, complicated if they have chronic ear disease um, or if they have uh, severe neurologic disease. So there are some patients that have a true sort of auditory neuropathy. Um, and oftentimes we actually still implant them, but their, their, um, uh, you know, their performance is uh, quite a bit more limited, as you would guess, because neural conditions are going are gonna to make it tougher. Um, and then one question came in about, um, so most of the data that you presented was at the six month time mark. Would there be any further improvement after six months? Yeah, so, so um, data has been followed out for you know, um, more than five years. We say that 80% of the improvement happens in the first three months, but the, that last 20 actually can happen over years. Um, and so by a year you see continued improvement. Um, the, the, um, the one that actually really improves long-term is, is hearing and noise. And hearing and noise, of course, requires a lot of sort of brain processing in addition to uh, just, um, just getting the sound there. And so um, that requires sort of extensive ongoing training. And so if you watch uh, hearing and noise, I'll see patients six, seven, eight years out, and they still say that they're improving in background noise. Okay. Um, and to kind of follow up that question, then do implants help with the tinnitus that patients might also be experiencing? I'm so glad you asked that question. So there's actually clinical trials um, looking at patients that have tinnitus and um, the vast majority of patients, over 70% of patients that get a cochlear implant get really good solid tinnitus suppression. Um, it's a really fascinating topic where you, they can literally take the device off and then their tinnitus will just go and start back on, they put it on and then it just shuts right back down. So it tells us that, that uh, you know, sort of the brain is looking for some sort of stimulation and in the absence of it, it creates this sort of phantom sound in some ways. And so um, cochlear implants are really good at suppressing tinnitus and, and two implants actually suppresses tinnitus more than, than one, surprisingly. So patients that have this screeching loud sort of jet engine tinnitus um, oftentimes go for a cochlear implant. Um, but they have to have enough hearing loss in that ear to really take that on. I see. I see. Okay, great. Um, another question. We've got a lot of questions. So you mentioned that there is some training that's done after the implantation. What does that entail? Is that with audiologists? Would that be with other yeah. um, therapists as well? Yeah. So initially there's, um, there's mapping and what mapping is, is we turn it up to a point on each of those electrodes so that it's loudness balanced and you get good frequency percepts. And what you'll find is um, interestingly, like the day it's turned on, they'll leave the office with it on and pretty loud. And by the time they've gotten to the garage, they can no longer hear because um, there's a lot of neural adaptation. So what we do is we keep walking up the programs until they get to a stable level. So that's the first thing. We want to stabilize their ability just to hear sound. And then what we often do with adults is suggest um, uh, lots of practice. Um, there's formalized and sort of informal practice. The, the informal stuff is sitting across the table and, and interacting with a loved one. And, and as you're um, looking at them and reading their lips and hearing the sound, you're practicing. Um, more formal stuff is more similar to like books on tape. Um, books on tape is a good one because you can read a book. As you're reading the book and you're listening, as long as those are synced up really well, 
um, what you're what you're able to do is give yourself you know positive and negative feedback for what you think you're hearing and what you're actually hearing. And so um, those are some of the things. And then there are more formal training programs as well, um, where people have developed different software programs to to uh, do basically the same kind of thing. That's really neat. I like that yeah. books on tape idea. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, do it, do it at home um, with your Audible subscription. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple other questions here. So do cochlear implants still fit in adulthood if placed as a child? Um, is that kind of where that 20 year lifespan would require a change anyways? So, so um, yeah, it's a one size fits all. Um, the devices have become smaller and smaller and smaller over time. So the devices that we put into little kids actually last. Um, I usually tell the families that they might need two or three um, surgeries in a lifetime. Um, so that's, that's a fair amount more than 20 years, but we use 20 years sort of as just a, as a ballpark, um, number. Um, what I see a lot today is over in the children's hospital is I see, um, families that are coming in for upgrades, um, because technology, as you would guess, changes and changes and changes. And so, um, these devices can stream, uh, with your cell phone. Um, they have the ability to block background noise and all kinds of stuff. So, um, it's very common that we okay families to get our children to get upgrades of their external equipment. Um, occasionally, the internal goes down. Um, if the internal goes down, it requires a revision surgery, which takes about 30 or 40 minutes to do. Um, so a really um, relatively simple um, surgery. Occasionally, the internal device goes down. Occasionally, there are recalls, but they are pretty darn um, uncommon. Um, so it's a really, really, really reliable device. Okay. And then... Yeah. Um another question that came in, which I also was wondering about, you mentioned that it's the patient's choice, which device they, that they want to pick and then you guys implant it. Um, how do they kind of pick between these devices? You mentioned the change, the difference in electrodes. Um, are there other considerations that patients are taking um, in when deciding? Yeah, it's a, another great question. So I, I tell patients, it's like looking at a BMW, a Mercedes and an Audi. All, all three of those are really good cars and they'll all get you from point A to point B. Um, but you certainly will have a preference. Um, things that they look at are um, sort of the, the physical um, aspect of what it looks like. Um, yep. They look at it, its ability to stream um, and, their, and their ability to use a remote control. Um, some elderly don't like remote controls and little buttons and these sorts of things. Um, and then uh, MRI compatibility. They're all MRI compatible today. Um, but they do require some some thinking about it. And so, in fact, the, the patients could care less about the electrode. Um, they yeah. really they, they really don't care about that at all. Yeah. Um, all they really care about is they usually ask, well, which one makes you hear better? And actually, the performance among the three companies is actually quite similar, although they do it um, in a different way. So I think a lot of it is about the bells and whistles, you know, recharging ability, what it looks like, MRI, you know, the the issues around MRI compatibility and whether you have a remote and whether it can stream and those kind of things. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. And, it, and it's a bit of an arms race, um, you would guess, between the companies. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, I think this will be the last question here. Uh, so do you have any specific guidance or important things for PCPs to know for long-term care of patients with cochlear implants? Yeah, so, um, so again, uh, uh, beyond the things that we just um, said, um, we do recommend, um, so I, I actually didn't bring up the meningitis issue. So about, um, it's probably 15 years ago now, there was a study that suggested that cochlear implant recipients were at a higher risk for meningitis. Um, much of that risk actually, um, when it was ultimately sorted out, was, was um, uh, related to a specific device. And it was a device that you actually put an extra piece of plastic inside the cochlea with it. And we thought that was cracking the cochlea and creating access for, for bacteria and biofilms and that sort of thing. So we still um, strongly recommend that adults um, receive um, pneumococcal vaccination. It's both in the form of um, Pneumovax as well as um, Prevnar. Um, so adults get or get or we're recommending to get Prevnar 13. So usually adults are getting Pneumovax right after age 65. And then we suggest that they get a Prevnar um, down the road from that. So I think that's important. The other thing is very, very low threshold um, to send a patient back to their ENT doc if there's an ear thing. And I would say anything that they're complaining about their ear and they have a cochlear implant in place, we probably should see them to check it. That makes sense. Is it the kind of situation that they would follow up with you maybe once in the clinic after the implantation and then as needed yeah. after, it wouldn't be like a year later yeah. for us to follow up? Yeah. So actually what we usually do is we see them at three months because we like to, to, 
to feel good with them and actually uh, have uh, see them with their, you know, with their spouse or their loved ones and have a conversation about how things have changed. It's part of the happy part for us because the audiologist might get all of that and we don't. Yeah. So we frequently see them back anyways. And then uh, we'll see them on an annual basis just to check their ear, make sure that the device is in good place, ask them about vaccination and see if they're interested in a second side. Okay, so. great. That's um, that's most of the questions that have come right. in thus far. Thank you so much for taking the time and going through everyone's questions. Definitely a topic that we as medicine doctors are interested to know about. And I think that maybe you'll see a little bit more referral coming your way. Great. So we're, we're doing, uh, just to give you some, um, some guess, you know, some some ballpark numbers. We're doing about 275 cochlear implants a year now. Wow. Uh, uh, you know, 10 years ago, most centers were doing like 50 to 75. Um, mm -hmm. We estimate that in the next five years, we'll probably be, you know, approaching like 400 or so. So this is sort of a rapidly growing area um, as you, as you would guess. So, so th uh, again, thanks so much for giving me the time to to talk about this. I hope this was valuable for, um, for everyone that's on. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and share my screen. You can feel free to log off, Dr. Buckman. Right. Thank you for your time. Right. Thanks so much. See ya.